स्मार्ट यू आर लिसनिंग टू अ मिंट प्रोडक्शन प्रॉट टू यू बाय एच टी स्मार्ट कास्ट हेलो एवरी वन एंड वेलकम बैक टू माई नॉट मिंट मनी आई एम शिप्रा फ्रॉम मिंट पर्सनल फाइनेंस टीम इन टू डेज एपिसोड आई विल चिट चैट विद बैंक बाजार सीईओ आदिल शेट्टी टू नो अबाउट हिज पर्सनल फाइनेंस जर्नी एज पार्ट ऑफ आर स्पेशल गुरु पोर्टफोलियो सीरीज हाई वेलकम टू वाई नॉट मिंट मनी a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth so let's get started on your money journey hi adil and welcome to why not mint money hi shipra great to be here so adil let's start by understanding what is your current asset mix right now between equity debt gold real estate and alternate asset class so my distribution is as follows in terms of my uh, liquid investments 80% is in equity 20% is in debt uh, i own uh, the house that i and my family live in and that is my uh, uh, only real estate investment no gold or uh, alternate asset exposure so um, you know i do have to buy uh gold in terms of the anniversary gift and the birthday gift that i need to you know ensure that uh, my wife is aligned with the way i think about investing uh, but it's limited to the sentimental value of uh, the gold uh, we buy it's more it's more for the for the design and what what she enjoys uh currently i don't have any uh, alternate investment but i should call out something uh, i have my equity ownership as a founder at bank bazaar and one would say that that is you know a startup alternate investment so i don't go the route of uh, investing in a vc fund or in an angel fund but given my ownership uh, as being a co-founder of bank bazaar one could say i have significant exposure in terms of alternate investment in the fintech or the startup space right and among the asset classes that you just mentioned uh, how has your portfolio performed over the past one year my uh, asset allocation especially given that it's primarily equity right uh, tends to be uh, on the index funds now if you look at the index over the last decade right uh, i have gotten about uh, 12% cagr on my investment but keep in mind uh, this is a passive index fund it tracks you know the bse sensex or the or the nifty 50 but i've been able to just using this passive investment strategy i actually don't have financial advisor i believe in following the index fund route i've been able to achieve a 12% cag over the last decade right adil as you mentioned that you don't have an investment advisor considering that you're an hni uh, but you don't uh, you know take help of any pms services or a professional advisor why is that So uh, you know when I went to graduate school uh, at Columbia one of the tenets of uh, corporate finance we learned over there is that the market typically performs better than uh, actively managed funds now I'm sure there are exceptions and I'll talk about them but if you look at the uh, one year period ending June 2021 and one would say it was a fairly turbulent period right uh, when covid uh, and and the pandemic had affected uh, everyone the index funds Uh, in a majority of cases uh, outperformed the actively managed funds so i fundamentally believe that uh, on on average the index will outperform managed funds which is why you know i i tend to have a light touch approach uh, you know i i i'm actively involved uh, with managing my, my business uh, i have a, a lot of experience in retail credit uh, in understanding how that works and when it comes to the stock market you know i like to have an approach which i believe uh, will work for the long run it'll work for my uh, daughter's education it'll work for my retirement savings but also an approach which is easily understood by me and people in my family so we tend to go with uh, index funds so the bsc sensex index fund the nifty 50 index fund uh, and uh, we believe that uh, the experience we've had and also the data like i said clearly called out that in a majority of cases the index has outperformed actively managed funds now that being said right uh, i do understand that there are exceptions and that stands out in the data too so for example if you were to look at let's say the small cap category or you were to look at a category where 
the index won't take exposure for example startups or fintechs i do understand there are exceptions but i think i'm i'm happy uh, with what uh, 12% caga i've been able to achieve with the passive bsc uh, sensex and the nifty 50 fund a couple of things i am considering however shifra is that there are now uh, new index funds which can move you from a market weightage so for example the challenge with let's say the bsc sensex or the nifty 50 is if you take the top 10 companies they typically are 66% weightage because the big companies tend to dominate uh, the index but today there are equal weight weightage index funds available so what that means is i can take the nifty 50 uh, and without going heavy on the big companies because i believe that uh, the smaller companies will will do better over time uh, as the better ones start to innovate and grow faster than you know what are today the largest companies but what i can do with an equal weightage fund is that each share in the nifty 50 equal weightage index gets an equal investment so that's something i'm constrained another thing i'm constrained right is just broad basing like i said because you never know where the winners are coming from and at the end of the day the nifty 50 or the bsc sensex uh does have a two third weightage on the top 10 companies by market cap another thing i'm considering is moving to uh, an index which covers a larger number of companies for example uh, an index which has 100 companies in it or even 200 companies listed in it so the two diversifications i'm considering along the lines of a passive uh, index fund is one to consider an allocation to an equal weight index fund and the other is to contain uh, consider an allocation to an index fund which has 100 to 200 companies versus the 30 or 50 that the main index has right have you ever invested in direct stocks are it great question uh, uh, shipra and i i get this asked all the time so my answer is no i have never invested in in direct stock not that you know one can't make a lot of money with uh, direct stock but what i find with myself and with most investors right is that we are very busy managing our uh, business we are busy managing our personal lives now we obviously need to be smart about money because protecting wealth is as important as making wealth uh, and what i find is if one were to distill the principles of personal finance uh, they are actually quite straightforward you know you don't need to be an active investor picking stock taking risk in order to reap the rewards of uh, what happens in the stock market uh, i think two things greatly influenced me like i said one was my education uh, that the market or the index presents the efficient frontier between risk and return and i do understand that there are exceptions to this but frankly i i don't have the insight or the time to clearly pick out the winners and losers either among stocks or amongst actively managed funds so I, i i tend to go with the index so because of that uh, interestingly a uh, i don't have a fund manager i follow the simple principles in fact uh, bank bazaar and i are publishing a book with some of these simple rules that people can follow and secondly right uh, i don't invest in direct stock just because i know they can make a lot of money but i don't want to take that kind of risk i would rather play the index uh, mutual fund and gain the benefit over the long term uh, as the entire market grows so i mean you know in my chats with entrepreneurs what i usually find is that uh, for the longest time they don't segregate their personal finances and business finances so how has your journey been on that front and when did you start segregating the two and how do you do it Yeah yeah great uh, question Shipra uh, see I understand what you're saying about entrepreneurs mixing their personal finance and business finance interestingly for me that was never an issue and I'll explain why but I had a different set of challenges I had to overcome which I'll talk about so the reason the separation was easy for me right is very early on bank bazaar the company which I co-founded started raising institutional money so we had the you know the walden the sequoia uh the amazons of the world investing and when that kind of investment happens the segregation is automatic uh because you know at that point in time you're a professionally run company you're presenting uh quarterly uh, mis uh you're going through you know all of these due diligences that each round of financing so the segregation between business institutional money and personal happened right from day one so i think fortunately that was driven by the discipline that comes with taking institutional money from a sequoia from a from an amazon from a from an experience 
Now the challenge I faced was a little different. The challenge I faced, right, is I was so involved with managing my corporate finances, saying what are we doing as a business, what's our PNL, how are we going to grow, that I would always put my personal financial management on the back burner. So it would be something that you know you spend 99% of your time on what you want to do with your corporate finances, and then you're like, as an aside, I'll just put one percent. For what you know, you want to do on the personal side. I think that was the mistake I made. And when someone puts such little time, right? Uh, some of the mistakes which I, if I could go back in time, would correct is I would probably start my SIP investment much earlier, uh, in my twenties, not in my thirties. Uh, I think that's the mistake number one I made. Uh, the second mistake I made, right, is today I understand the benefit of protection because. I have a family. I have a daughter. Uh, today, right, my life insurance is 10x of my annual income. But again, it was something I started in my mid 30s. I probably could have saved a lot of money if I started a decade earlier, because you're aware that the life insurance premium is locked for life. So once you sign on for a policy till you're 75, right, what you pay on life insurance premium, and bear in mind this doesn't happen for any other premium. That you tend to buy it doesn't happen for health, it doesn't happen for car, but you lock in your life insurance premium at time zero for the next forty years. I started that in my thirties. Uh, anyway, cutting a long story short, uh, I think when I started spending twenty percent of time on managing my personal finance better, I realized that I would never be a world class expert at picking stock. Uh, I think it's a learning I had very quickly. Uh, I had seen uh, a lot of people make a lot of money, but I had also seen a lot of people lose a lot of money. And what I realized is that my investment strategy is more for long term, uh, and it is to grow what I have built. Uh, uh, you know, by being an entrepreneur, by building out Bank Bazaar, I want to protect my capital and I want to grow it. And as I did more research, right, uh, I realized that you could actually cut through the clutter, uh, that you could actually use. What are scientifically and data proven instruments to build your wealth over the long term, and that uh, you know ended up bringing me to the index fund. That ended up you know bringing me to ELSS. That ended up also me realizing that certain parts of my portfolio are more emotional, right? So you pressed me on two questions. One was obviously on gold, uh, and you know again gold tends to do well in in tough times. But gold again, I believe, tends to be a very volatile asset. Same thing with my home, right? Uh, it is uh, an illiquid investment. You know, would I be better off renting? Uh, I I do think so. You know, a lot of advisors out there, and I do agree with them. Uh, from a return on investment, will I make a lot of capital gains on my home? I I would not. But I love my home, right? We are building a life over here. My Uh, everything we have in our home is something we've talked about, something we've picked up. You know, when when we've traveled around India, when we've traveled uh, internationally. So there's a story behind everything we have in our home, and you know we love it. But jewelry and home are more of a emotional purchase for us, uh, and I think that's been my evolution as an investor. Right, quite interesting. So talking about your investment strategy, since you you know squarely handle it yourself. What is the one strategy you would say that has worked for your investment portfolio in the last one year, and what is the one strategy that has not worked for your portfolio? See, I think unfortunately I have a very boring answer here, but in this boringness, I feel that um, there there is a simplicity which can help the common investor. Uh, a lot of times, right? We have uh, all these jargons, we have all these funds. Like I said, I've answered uh, the question with. I think one line, eighty percent in equity, all of that in index mutual fund. Now, what has worked for me, right, is that over the last year, uh, the index has done well. So, what I mean by that is uh, because the market has grown, because both the uh, BSC, uh, Sensex, and the Nifty have done well, uh, I have benefited when the market does well. Not to say that there are not points in time where the index has been down, right? So, even if you look at a three-year moving average. There have been 10% of times uh, when you know uh, I have been out of the money, but like I said, my investing strategy is for the long run. Now, what have I made a mistake on, or what have I missed on? Right now, this goes back to the same point. When you tend to bet on the index, you tend, on average, right, to do better 
than managed funds. But the data clearly shows that there are certain categories of funds, there are certain types of alternate investments which would have done better than what I have done, right? So um, again, without going into too much detail, the small cap category of funds, a lot of them, right, a majority of them have actually outperformed the index. The same might be said for, you know, alternate investments, like you really hear of all these startups, of all these fintechs which are doing really well. And obviously, there are some of them which have done incredibly well to levels, you know, I could never think about owning an index fund. So those are the things I've missed on. But frankly, right, it's something I'm reconciled to. And maybe some of it is also based on the fact that I do have exposure being an entrepreneur and a co-founder and a, a significant owner in a large privately held fintech company, Bank Bazaar. But that is the share of risk I want to carry uh, as an entrepreneur, co-founder, owner. Uh, and I think the rest just goes into index funds. Right. Okay, so before we move on to, you know, other questions, just one last thing on your equity investments. Do you invest via SIPs or lump sums or a mix of both and how? Yeah, a mix of both, right? Uh, I think SIPs are probably the single most important thing uh, any, any person can do. Uh, and I think that uh, for me personally, the learning was that it inculcated discipline. So what I mean by that, right, is when money goes of your, out of your account on the 5th of every month, you know that you have to manage with the rest of what you have. The problem with the uh, uh, lump sum, right, is that I find it's good in a one-off case. Like, let's say that uh, I got a bonus payment or let's say that, you know, uh, there was money coming in from somewhere. Then a one-time makes sense. But the problem with the one-time is it's very easy to put it off or to very easy to forget it. So SIP, I think, is the best way uh, to go in, into the mutual fund industry. And obviously, one sum when uh, one off when uh, you know you have access to that uh, uh, one off, right? So so let's say that you know some other kind of asset was sold, and there is a one off. Then that's when the one off comes. But the SIP, I think, is the best way to do it. But do you keep some cash handy so that you know whenever there's a correction in the market, you put in some lump sum? So here's the thing, I do keep cash handy, but it's for a different reason. So I don't keep cash handy for when I can time the market because, you know, I'm someone who believes that it's very hard to time the market. I think that if one uh, consistently uh, keeps investing and one has the ability to hold for, you know, five to ten years and my holds are, like I said, for my daughter's education, she's four years old now. So she's starting kindergarten. So I have a plenty of time to think about it. My other hold is for post-retirement. I am 43 right now. Uh, I was hoping I could, you know, say I was uh, uh, still in my still 40, but I am 43 now. So I'm holding for quite quite a long uh, time. So I don't believe I can time the market. So I I, I keep a, a emergency fund uh, separately. Uh, now the emergency fund is more for one-time expenses and. You know, today I'm surprised uh, the number of expenses that can be lump sum expenses that you need to uh, pay for, right? So I think all of us are aware summer's over. You know, one who's anyone who's taken a holiday realizes that today a holiday is quite expensive. So, you know, that's a lump sum, you know, one needs to plan for every year. But I've realized that even school fees is now so expensive, right? Uh, uh, it is a considerable amount that you need to actually plan to keep aside in order to be able to pay in March of every year and obviously an emergency fund, right? Because, you know, you never know when you need money urgently and then an, uh, equity mutual fund is not the best place to keep urgently needed money, right? So you never should have to sell when the market is bad and typically you need these emergency funds when the market is bad. So I do have an emergency fund for one-time expenses. So it's not kept aside to time the market. It's more kept aside for what I know are one-time expenses. A, uh, my daughter's school fee. B, my uh, family holiday. And C, an emergency fund for real emergencies. So how many months do you provision for, for an emergency fund? Just the emergencies part. So just the emergency part, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the range uh, is between three to six months uh, of salary. So if you are not working for three to six months, that's what uh, you should have. Currently, I'm on the lower side, but you know the the goal is to set aside six months uh, of your salary 
uh, that you can draw on in case uh, there was some emergency so since bank bazaar sells credit cards to consumers out there i want to know how many credit cards do you own okay that's a great question so uh, i own multiple credit cards but i want to call out that i manage them very prudently so what i mean by that is this is the first expense i plan and clear out in my monthly payment so on the first of every month right all these payments are done now just let me explain uh, uh, why i have five uh, credit cards right so um, i have a card which i've had uh, for over 5 years now uh, and this is a card which gives me airline miles uh and you know historically that's what cards were very famous for but when covid happened right very interestingly we were never able to travel so i actually ended up converting all those points which i earned on airline miles into amazon gift cards which i used to buy books for my daughter because she really loves books and is into reading books so that's my classic 5 year old airline miles card um i have a couple of cards which i use actively right now and both are co branded credit cards by bank bazaar uh but there's a particular reason i use them so i use a credit card called pin booster which is co-branded between yes bank and bank bazaar and the reason i use it right is um there are about 100 no cost emi 6 to 12 month no cost emi that we run on uh, electronic goods uh, on amazon every month so for example um, you know i'm thinking about purchasing a new tv because my old one is now 5 years old uh, and i like the fact that i can take a fix or a 12 month no cost emi i don't pay any interest and i can buy you know uh, a sony or an lg tv uh, and it's a one click checkout process on the pin, pin booster credit card um, i also use a third credit card that's also a bank bazaar co branded credit card with yes bank called save max and essentially i do it because now that uh, movement has started uh, it gives me 5x accelerated rewards on fuel so i use it for all of my uh, fuel spends again i don't want to complicate things too much uh, i manage my credit cards very tightly but i have a fourth credit card which is my amazon uh, credit card i use it for the 5% cash back as an amazon prime customer that i get on the amazon icici bank credit card lastly i have a corporate charge card this is an amex corporate charge card and the corporate card takes care of corporate uh, expenses Uh, which i can then uh, uh, you know run as a corporate uh, expense so these are the uh, five credit cards i have i hope uh, i didn't overwhelm you with information shipra <laughs> no no not at all but uh, what okay. i'm curious to know is that are you always on a lookout for a new card depending on you know uh, what kind of rewards and offers uh, that keep coming up in the market or uh, is it more aligned with you know your need spending needs and spending patterns No I'm actually not very actively on the lookout right each of my credit cards came in with a specific desire there's actually a one to one mapping between a desire and why I ended up with the card and I would actually claim that I have achieved my uh, uh desire and I know it's a broad word but I have achieved my desire with what I went in I'm just going to quickly map this all right so I went with the airline miles card at a point in time that uh, airline uh, miles uh where the number one category for credit cards and i must say right i have bought uh, international holiday tickets for my family with the points i've accumulated on that card so it happened at a point in time that airline miles were the go to thing in credit cards in india and like i said i have paid for my annual family vacation airline with that benefit so i got what i wanted when no cost emi slash bnpl started taking off i think that drove my fin booster yes bank bank bazaar co branded card because i was amazed to find right that every month across every white good category right i'm talking about televisions i'm talking about refrigerators i'm talking about laptop cell phone in any category right i was completely amazed to find that i could access 6 to 12 month no cost emi not one rupee interest going out of my pocket but i have a 12 month no cost emi on amazon on a sony tv on an lg tv or on a new laptop so i i just found that it's mind blowing that that kind of benefit existed uh so i think that that's what uh, ended up being the key benefit that i took on the pin booster card and it also gives me a 5x accelerated reward on online dining and we end up doing online dining uh, at the big sites right at least once a week 
So we set aside a day every week where we say we're going to order in. Uh, and it's a really fun day because every week we discuss where we're going to order from. And the pin booster card gives me a 5x reward on online dining. So I really like it. Thank then you. when the pandemic receded, right, uh, my fuel expenses uh, started being really high because uh, my daughter's in pre-primary. So the, uh, the school bus was not available. So we end up dropping her. I end up having meetings all the time. So my fuel expenses are over 10,000 rupees a month. And I just realized that if I can get accelerated reward on fuel, and obviously, uh, you know, I get uh, the refund on the surcharge also. So I ended up going with the Save Max co-branded credit card between Bank Bazaar and, and RBL Bank. It also offers me 5x accelerated reward on groceries. So again, a need drove it. I'm using it for all of my fuel and groceries, and I'm seeing the benefit immediately. Uh, Adin, do you have life and health insurance? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, I'd say that uh, these two are priority even before one thinks about uh, investing. Uh, the reason being that uh, this covers the downside risk, uh, both in terms of death and hospitalization, which are incredible. So like I said, the importance is so high that uh, the allocation to term life insurance uh, and to health insurance happens even before I think about uh, investing. As far as uh, life insurance goes, I only do term life insurance. So it's a single uh, bullet payout if I die uh, before the age of 75. So there's nothing else to it. It's a very, very simple product. Uh, I have been able to currently achieve the rule of thumb, which is 10x uh, of your uh, 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 annual income uh, minus uh, whatever loan obligations you have. And typically the biggest loan obligation most people and I have is the home loan uh, principal outstanding and that's really important because uh, when you die uh, if you die while running a home loan the borrower right actually has a lien on the property uh, and your uh, heirs, heirs are responsible for paying off the home loan in terms of health insurance this is critical um, the mistake uh, i made in my 20s i don't make it anymore but i'd assume that oh i have corporate health insurance and I'm fully covered, so it should be fine. But what I've realized uh, through, you know, experience of family members uh, is that when you uh, 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 retire or let's say you start your own company uh, and you don't have corporate health insurance, it's very, very important at a young age to buy your own uh, family floater policy. So I have a, a, a significant uh, uh, policy. The premium is fairly large. I believe it will be su sufficient for the next 30 to 40 years. And it is a health insurance uh, mediclaim policy for my entire family. And I will have it independent of where I work. Uh, and uh, it's a policy I've been carrying. And I'm happy I took it, uh, uh, I think, about six, seven years ago. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I got a, a reasonable premium. Not that the premium doesn't increase, right? So every three years, the premium of my health insurance mediclaim does increase. But it happens for a large cohort of customers uh, and still it's much, much cheaper than what it is if I were to go to buy a, a policy myself today. Right. Okay, so that's about, uh, you know, your investments and your uh, life insurance coverage. Now, let's talk a little about your personal life and your relationship with money. Any lifestyle changes during the lockdown that have become permanent? I think two lifestyle changes, uh, one family and one personal uh, that happened uh, during the, the lockdown. So one lifestyle change, right, is I used to also, you know, be someone who thought of um, having a meal as something that is uh, uh, one of the extra uh, things we need to squeeze into the day. So, for example, you know, it would be a rushed breakfast. Um, I wouldn't really spend time. Uh, with my family, you know, lunch was at work, it was at the computer, uh, dinner was probably, you know, again, maybe in front of the television. But I think I read something uh, during the lockdown which had a significant influence on me, which is that uh, the time that we spend in meals with family is actually the core uh, to uh, our day. And it has a significant impact in ensuring that, you know, we're relaxed and mentally in a good frame of mind. So one practice which we've started which I believe I'll continue for the rest of my life, is really allocating sufficient time to have a nice sit down, proper meal, whichever one we can, right? Uh, breakfast, dinner, if one is in work from home on certain days, even lunch, 
but setting that time aside for a one hour lunch um you know my holiday this year was in italy and the joke is you know italians spend 2 hours over lunch but they actually believe that uh, it's not a wasted time but that's what life is about and it also makes you more productive as a professional but we've allocated family meals especially uh, dinner and if we can lunch on a work from home basis it has to be a 60 minute process where we talk about you know our day and listen to our daughter and so on and so forth so that was one change uh the second change right and i think a lot of people have done it uh is just being really more disciplined about uh, uh exercise and i think i had one more thing fortunately which happened which is uh, drove driven me to it so because my daughter has started school um we have to get her to the school bus um uh, by 7 a.m. or we have to ensure she's dropped in school by uh, 7:30 a.m. so what that's opened up right it's opened up a morning slot uh wherein i'm able to get my uh, 30 minutes of exercise in uh before i start my day so i think these are two things uh which i started recently and which i will continue for the rest of my life god willing right quite wonderful uh what is your Thank idea you. of uh, wealth adil great question uh, uh shipka and you know i wonder about this uh, often and um, the reason i wonder right is uh you know that people i see you know who uh, have a lot of money but are always just trying to under stress manage things and i see people you know with less per se bank balances but who i believe are leading much more wholesome lives so wealth to me right is actually having in financial terms uh, a spend which is smaller than one's earning so i think one is wealthy when you are able to live happily within your means so that is my idea of wealth right uh, how do you involve your spouse in family finances a uh, great question uh, i think it started uh, and this is central to uh, us sharing our personal finances which is owning owning our home jointly so she is a co-owner of the property along with me now obviously there are many uh, additional benefits to having a spouse as a co-owner uh a uh, uh, a female spouse as a co-owner so one is obviously uh banks of uh, uh, better home loan rates uh and you also get tax benefits on both sides uh, of earning spouses but all those i think are secondary i think owning a home together is a mark and a symbol of our uh, equal uh, uh ownership in our uh, finances together so that i think that is one central a uh, foundation that's driven our personal finances the second thing i try and do right and this is more driven by some of the bad experiences i have seen uh 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 you know looking and helping people with personal finance i've seen a situation wherein um a uh, uh, earning spouse died uh, and the other spouse actually didn't know what are the bank accounts what are the uh, investments where is the money what is happening uh, that i found to be very very scary so what i tend to do right is when i tend to make a uh, investment and when i do my uh, annual tax planning i make sure my wife is cc'd in all communication with the chartered accountant uh, also today there are some easy to use tools for example um, you know i'm not sure too many people are aware of this but you can actually collate um, all your insurance policies in the national insurance repository it's called nia so basis a single aadhar number all your insurance policies life health car are available in one spot and that linkage is possible i've done that right and i made sure that the access credentials are also with my wife so um you know uh, we uh, are uh, aligned on the investment philosophy i spoke about so in the sense she knows all my long term is going to be in index i uh, i know what she invests and what she we invest for our daughter is an in index so we're not going to be surprised that she finds uh, find, finds out that i move 50% of our allocation to this one company she knows it's not going to happen and i know she's not going to do the same so basically we agree on our philosophy which is, which is the passive index fund investing and two is just transparency in making sure that if something were to happen to me um she would be able to access and she'd be aware of both my assets and my liabilities because on a periodic basis right uh, every year every 6 months she knows where my money is going uh, and if something were to happen to me like with the insurance nia repository 
she has the access credentials that she can track real time status right so that brings us to the last question of the podcast uh, which is what do you teach your daughter about money and wealth <laughs> great question uh, and very timely also so my daughter is only 4 uh, years old right so let me talk about two lessons uh, i've been trying to do with her so in fact at 4 years old counting is a big deal so uh, for example um, you know uh, she collects uh, and she has a small number of coins with her so we play counting games so she'll be a shopkeeper and i'll be a customer and um, you know i'll tell her hey you're selling something do you want to sell it for more or do you want to sell it for less and you know she'll be like oh i want to sell it for more and i'll be okay uh, uh, how much do you want for this uh, uh, unicorn toy and she'll be like i want 5 rupees so i'll count out 5 rupees and then i'll tell her that hey listen i only have 2 uh, rupee coins or only have you know 2 uh, uh, euro coins um if i give you three of these and you want to leave five how much do you have to give me back and obviously she is not able to you know understand all these concepts but you know this small game uh, i find um will uh, you know help her with counting adding minusing difference and all those core uh, uh, concepts the other thing i think is just understanding that no matter how wealthy you are uh, there'll always be a trade off between what you need and what you want right and that's going to be a constant feature it's been a constant feature of my life and i think it will be a constant feature of most people's life so trying to decide what you need and what you want so for example uh, she's really been wanting to go uh, uh, on a horse ride and she's really been wanting a toy now obviously these two are unconnected right a carriage ride on a horse Uh, and a toy have no connection but the question i've been asking her is hey uh, we have to choose between the two uh, because that's what we can do and that's what you know we constantly need to do would you rather do the horse carriage horse ride which you really want or would you rather buy this face mask toy that you really want and you pick the two and we'll do what you want this month so i think these are the kinds of things i try and teach her when she's 4 years old and obviously right i'm also learning a lot because i've never this is my first child uh, and i'm also trying to you know just read up in terms of uh, and it's actually you know now that you mention it it's very hard to find reading material on this because you know uh, i found a lot of great books in terms of how to talk to children uh, how children's minds develop you know some very easy to use tools about how to teach children to reduce uh, 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 frustration how to get them to talk and how talking actually helps the situation incredibly even if we don't find a solution but i've not found really good material on how to teach children about money so maybe you know if you cover something like this or you know i find some kind of writing on this in the mint right i'll use that as part of my learning to how how to teach my daughter about money right we'll definitely consider consider this request and you know try to do a story around it thank uh, you All right uh, thanks a lot for joining us today Adil and opening up about your personal finances i'm sure that our uh, listeners you know have a lot of takeaways from this conversation That brings us to the end of today's episode If you would like to know more about this topic or make a suggestion of a personal finance topic that you would like us to cover i can be reached at twitter under the username of shipra singh sorath and on linkedin at shipra singh Thank you for tuning in see you in the next episode This was a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.